Hey guys, welcome to this week's FAQ in Freebie Friday. Now for those of you new to the YouTube channel, these videos are all about answering your health related questions. So if you have a question concerning your health or health in general, something regarding diet, nutrition, supplements, herbs, or really anything related to health and wellness, and you would like our help in answering your questions, all you have to do is leave those questions in the comment section below, and we'll be answering those based on popularity, the questions that we feel are gonna be the most beneficial to the group overall, and of course, the questions that we are capable of answering. Now, something else really great about these videos is that every week from that comment section, we select one lucky person to win a free bag of tonic herbs or medicinal mushrooms. So even if you don't have a question for us this week, but you're interested in winning some free herbs or mushrooms, all you have to do is simply subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't yet already, give this video a thumbs up, and then just leave any comment in the comment section below. And with all that being said, let's get to this week's questions. Okay, so taking a look at our first question, this question reads, what would you say about the essential nutrient choline? Okay, so choline is an essential nutrient. It is produced as a byproduct of citation to produce various salts in the body, and it particularly activates the cholerogenic system, which does have negative implications if overly stimulated. So there is such a thing as getting too much choline, which would result in an excess production of acetylcholine and the activation of the cholerogenic system. So this is something you do not want. However, I think it's very difficult to get an excessive amount of acetylcholine if you're getting your choline through diet, which is usually going to come in the form of phosphatidylcholine or some sort of phospholipid. And that leads me to sort of the major benefits or uses or mechanisms of choline in the body, which is that it does act as a primary building block substance to the fatty cell membrane or the membrane of the cell which gives it its integrity and its structure. So it's very important for the membrane structure of all of the cells in your body and your body is just a collection of cells. So you do need choline for cellular structural integrity and without it you can run into a lot of issues on a cellular level. It's also essential for taking the fat that's in your liver and converting it into LDL cholesterol. So if you don't have enough choline, you can run into fatty liver disease and cholesterol issues. So the liver can actually accumulate fat in excess, which results in fatty liver. And oftentimes, just a choline deficiency can result in fatty liver disease, which can be brought on through a deficiency of choline, through not getting enough choline in the diet, but also the consumption of alcohol and other stressors can deplete the choline in the body, resulting in fatty liver. And it's also used for methylation in the body, which can have pros and cons depending on how you look at it. But again, if you're getting choline from the diet, it's probably gonna be an adequate amount and not too much. And then of course, choline's gonna be very essential actually for eliminating excess estrogen from the body. So choline obviously has a lot of important roles in the body and a deficiency in it can lead to a lot of issues fatty liver disease being one of them, the inability to metabolize or detoxify estrogen amongst uh, structural issues in the cell membrane. So you wanna make sure you're getting enough choline and in terms of diet, really animal products are gonna be the best source of choline. Uh, in fact, egg yolks and things like beef liver are really the only bioavailable sources of choline because the only plant forms that you're gonna really find that have any choline in them, so things like soy or sunflower lecithin could have some choline in it, but a very, very small concentration. I think about 13% is contained in something like sunflower lecithin or sunflower oil or soy products, the rest of it being polyunsaturated fats. And if you're familiar with our YouTube channel, then you know that polyunsaturated fats, they're toxic to the metabolism, they're toxic to the thyroid, they have powerful anti-metabolic effects, and they can contribute to the degeneration of the brain, as talked about in this article here, and a whole host of other issues. So trying to get a sufficient amount of dietary choline through something like soy or sunflower, which are going to have a larger concentration of polyunsaturated fats, is going to first and foremost be difficult 
because you're not going to get a high concentration of dietary choline in its bioavailable form. But there's also a lot of accompanying downsides to trying to consume these foods, which is that first and foremost, they do contain a lot of polyunsaturated fats. They are generally anti-metabolic. They have anti-thyroid effects. And even in their prepared form, soy and sunflower can be irritating to the gut and lead to inflammation. So the safer route to go and the more effective way to get dietary choline would be through the consumption of eggs and particularly the egg yolk and beef liver. Now do keep in mind that chickens do have a higher concentration of polyunsaturated fats. So if you're consuming chicken, you want to make sure that whether it's the chicken or the egg, you're getting something that is ideally pastured. So something that hasn't been fed corn, soy, and other grains rich in polyunsaturated fats. So that way the egg yolks that you are consuming have a lesser amount of the toxic polyunsaturated fats and more of a higher saturated fat content again, if they're a pastured chicken. So I recommend when it comes to eggs and dairy and certain animal products that you really go for quality. So more than anything else that you're eating, I think when in terms of getting super high quality food, something like eggs should be uh, sourced from the best possible place that you can find. Something that again is verified to not be fed soy, corn, and other grains. So you're gonna mostly find that probably at a local farm. Maybe if you're lucky, you'll find it at your natural grocer. So the summary is that choline is essential. It's essential nutrient in the sense that you're not gonna get it uh, internally. Your body's not gonna produce it itself. You're going to have to consume it through diet or supplementation but most supplements are probably gonna give you too much choline that could convert into excessive acetylcholine and aggravate the cholerogenic system, which could result in stress and the overactivation of nerves and things as such related to stress. You're better off getting it through dietary sources and the safest and most effective sources of dietary choline are going to be egg yolks and beef liver. You're probably gonna to wanna to stay away from the consumption of soy and sunflower in general because of, again, their fat stress structure, the high amount of polyunsaturated fats. Also, those foods tend to be highly genetically modified, sprayed with herbicides and pesticides, and have a lot of downsides to them. So in summary, you do want to get dietary choline through egg yolks or beef liver. I think consuming about two egg yolks a day or a couple ounces of beef liver a week will give you sort of the recommended daily uh, requirement for choline, which is somewhere between 200 and like 450 milligrams, depending on your stress level. If you're a woman and you're pregnant, you're gonna want around more 450 milligrams of choline uh, in a day. So you're gonna wanna get a little bit more than normal, I think, if you're just undergoing any sort of stress. All right, getting to our second question. This question reads, when I have PMS, I crave about three times as much coffee and chocolate as usual. Is this due to raised estrogen levels at that time? So I think, yes, you're probably right that you're craving things like coffee and chocolate more as you're entering the menstrual cycle because of elevated levels of estrogen. So the beginning stages of your menses, estrogen levels increase. There's a surge or release of estrogen to cause the follicles to rupture so that way you can lose the egg and produce a new egg so that way you can shed the lining of the uterus and go through this whole sort of womb detoxification, if you will, that's largely contributed to estrogen stress effects and you will experience adverse side effects or symptoms if you are low thyroid and low progesterone. So although estrogen is going to rise and I think no matter what you're going to notice a shift in your energy and your health during the early part of the menstrual cycle, if you're low thyroid and low progesterone then you're going to really notice the adverse side effects because estrogen is otherwise regulated by progesterone in the thyroid hormone. So this is probably indicating higher levels of estrogen if you're sort of craving these sorts of foods which do have anti-estrogen-like properties. So I've talked about in this video here how coffee can actually help to lower estrogen because it competes with the estrogen receptor and in this way sort of the caffeine can bind to the estrogen receptor competing or out competing the estrogen in the body, which can have sort of an anti-estrogen effect. Uh, caffeine and coffee in particular also synergize with and act like progesterone and thyroid in the body, thus exerting an anti-estrogen effect. So it is likely that uh, you are experiencing high levels of estrogen like most women do in the early part of uh, the menstrual cycle, but it's likely that you have low thyroid and lower progesterone than normal if you're experiencing adverse side effects. But do keep in mind that I think 
think like pregnancy, the menstrual cycle is a stressful process and no matter what, I think you're gonna experience lower thyroid function than normal. But if you are doing things to keep your progesterone levels at an optimal range, you shouldn't really have a very uncomfortable, unhealthy menstrual cycle. So a menstrual cycle shouldn't be uh, very noticeable in the sense that you're experiencing really adverse side effects. You certainly shouldn't be suffering and miserable, you know, having horrible bleeding, uh, blood clots, very bad cramping, being very lethargic, uh, having mood imbalances. I think no matter what, you'll have some subtle differences, but if you have really bad or negative symptoms during the menstrual cycle, then this is a sign of low progesterone and hypothyroidism. Because again, when those hormones are in check or in optimal ranges, they will mitigate or attenuate a lot of the effects of estrogen. So again, I think it is very probable, it's at least a logical thought that you're craving foods that do have both pro-thyroid and anti-estrogen-like effects when you are entering a cycle that is driven by or initiated by high levels of estrogen. So I don't think cacao has any uh, documented anti-estrogen effect, but it does have a dopaminogenic effect. It can increase dopamine, which could have a positive effect on the other protective hormones and generally have a, an anti-stress effect, which could be very beneficial and signs that you know your menstrual cycle is having a stressful effect on the body. Uh, cacao also contains a high amount of magnesium which is usually depleted under stress so usually uh, low magnesium levels are something that you want to correct in hypothyroidism so that could be a reason you're craving the chocolate is because you're craving the magnesium uh, same with coffee a very high amount of magnesium also contains a lot of B vitamins both coffee and chocolate do have a lot of the nutrients that are essential for a proper thyroid function so it's not necessarily that you have a problem you know you're craving these things for reason because there's foods and nutrients in there that can help bring your body back into balance. Now obviously you can use these foods sort of therapeutically in this way but at the same time you're going to want to make sure you're taking a look at the health of your thyroid and progesterone levels to make sure that you're not dependent on these things overall. Something that I noticed for myself was that when I was really hypothyroid I would be sort of dependent on coffee. I needed it. It was the first thing I thought about when I woke up. Like it was my life source. And then when I corrected my hypothyroidism, there's days I can go without having coffee at all, or I could generally have it or not have it, but I don't have the same sort of obsession or compulsion towards it that I did in the past. And I think that, again, I just corrected the underlying hypothyroidism. It's not to say that you can't use things like coffee and chocolate to increase your metabolic rate, to exert sort of a thermogenic anti-stress effect. You just wanna make sure that you're not relying on them all the time and that you're using them in this way very uh, consciously or using them sort of therapeutic in this way and just again not depending on them entirely. So I don't think there's anything wrong with craving these things. I think following your cravings is the best way to go to keep your body in balance. Your body has thousands of built-in mechanisms for achieving homeostasis and your cravings and appetite for food are probably the most effective and the most uh, readily available for you to use to help bring your body into balance. So I say follow those cravings, but of course when it comes to eating chocolate and coffee, first and foremost don't do it on an empty stomach, or at least the coffee. Make sure that you're having coffee with food, that you're adding cream and sugar to balance the calcium to phosphorus ratio, and to also bring down any elevations of prolactin or parathyroid, and that you're adding the sugar so that way you can mitigate uh, the potential blood sugar lowering effects of just consuming black coffee or caffeine. So Having good quality coffee, something that is maybe organic or mold free uh, if you're worried about mold toxins and adding cream and sugar to again balance the coffee out overall and make sure that doesn't have a stressful effect. Pretty much all of coffee's negative effects are associated with taking too much coffee or caffeine in a small period of time and one thing that could mitigate that is again consuming it with food or adding cream and sugar and then in terms of chocolate just make sure you get a good quality chocolate you know something that's free of added oils make sure it doesn't have polyunsaturated fats or trans fats or you know bad fats added to it i'd probably stay away from maybe milk chocolate unless it's organic because you don't know if that milk is you know from conventional 
dairy that is fed a diet rich in polyunsaturated fats and pumped with hormones. So if you're gonna do milk chocolate, just make sure that it's an organic chocolate bar that is using organic milk. But otherwise, yeah, I think you're right in the sense that you're probably craving these things due to high estrogen. So use those in that way, just make sure they're quality sources. And at the same time, take a look into the health of the thyroid, doing everything you can to support thyroid health throughout that time. So don't go on a low carb diet while you're on your menstrual cycle, that's a horrible idea. In fact, eat as much uh, organic ripe fruit as you can get plenty of healthy carbohydrates to make sure that your liver is storing enough glycogen through that stressful period so that way your liver has the ability to metabolize the excess estrogen because that could be another thing related to really high estrogen and pms symptoms is that your liver isn't healthy enough to metabolize the excess estrogen in your body it could be low levels of sex hormone binding globulin amongst other things so i think you know, follow those cravings, but also maybe check out the perfect thyroid course and also check out this video here for some tips on improving your progesterone levels. All right, guys, that brings this week's FAQ and Freebie Friday to a close. If you've enjoyed it and found it helpful, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't yet already. And remember, if you're interested in winning some free herbs or mushrooms, all you have to do to be entered to win is make sure that you have followed those cues and given this video a like and hit that subscribe button, but also be sure to drop a comment or question in the comment section below.